The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Father Andrew Kinstetter. Hi, Father Andrew. Hey, Dom. And Pat Scott. Hi, Pat. Greetings and salutations. <laughs> Happy New Year, and welcome back from your holiday. Uh, we celebrated Christmas and New Year's and Epiphany and the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, all the time spent since the last time uh, we had an episode. Uh, we had a, a nice long break. Uh, and we're going to be talking tonight about uh, the things that were, came up at the big consumer electronics show, the annual show in Las, Las Vegas. And that's kind of significant because uh, that was one of our first shows a year ago was about that very same topic. So uh, we're, we're going to be kind of looking at, at what's new this year. And it's it's kind of fun. It helps. Some of the, sometimes the products at CES are a bit fanciful. They, we may never, may never see some of these things come to market, but it's um, it, it's a, sometimes an indicator of where things might be going. So let's let's kind of talk about some of the things that were big at CES this year. Uh, so some of the some of the more fanciful products, like let's let's talk about the the uh, Wally floating chair. Uh, I mean the. Segway S Pod. Everybody compared it to that chair that the big fat humans in uh, Wally were floating around on. But it's a it's a it's Segway from the the people from the stand up scooter, uh, uh, you know the that you see all over cities with tourists riding or mall cops riding. <laughs> now it's uh, they have a chair which is a two wheel chair uh, that balances itself. That's the big Segway thing. Uh, the interesting thing about the S pod is that it's controlled by a joystick. So you sit in it and then you control it with a joystick. Now, what do you think about these chairs and what they, they talk about that they may eventually make them available for consumers, but they're really thinking about them for, uh, commercial, you know, fleet selling them in bulk to businesses. W what do you think these could be used for, uh, when they get on the market eventually? Any ideas? Well, I was thinking about, you know, when uh, some of us aging population are going to places like resorts or, or mm. Disney World or, or something where there's lots of walking, something like this to rent during the day would be yeah. very, very nice. That's I know it's entertainment based, but, you know, us old people, we got old legs and sometimes you really can't. When we, Last time I went to Disney World with my mom years ago, uh, she has a hard time getting around. And we got her a, a scooter, like a motorized scooter. Uh, but those are those. I don't. I think those may be a little bulkier than than one of these. You think the scooter would be bulkier than this? Uh, maybe I don't know. I mean, it was a sit down scooter. But then, I mean, looking at a picture of one of these, it, they are pretty bulky <laughs> in and of themselves. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the advantage of this is. Is it higher up? I don't know. What do you think? What what what's the what? So in other words, what's the point of, of the S-Pod? I get the difference between this and, say, the regular Segway, the transporter, yeah. which is instead of having to stand, you can sit. Uh, but I well, that, that's the big thing for me is that for yeah. people who have trouble with, with veins or that type of thing, this would be a way to do that. And especially if it's things like going through a zoo or through a park or something where there's nice rolling walkways that you could you could ride through, it would let some people be able to participate where they couldn't otherwise. Right. As far as a commercial use, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think, Father? <laughs> I am sort of at a loss. I, <laughs> I mean, I guess um, you can see a mall cop riding one around the mall in one of those. <laughs> that just that, uh, but yeah, th those sorts of situations just seem very wrong to be riding a r sitting in a in a Segway. You know, <laughs> you're younger yeah. than I am, though, <laughs> and, and, and and that's that's definitely my perspective. When I when I go to a city and I see the fleet of Segways touring the city, I sort of just chuckle at them because. It's not something that I personally would want to do. Right. Um, and I know that or well, what I would want to do is I'd I'd want to take one out just just for fun. I wouldn't use it as a way to avoid walking. Right. Um and so even this sit down segue, I uh, when I saw it, I again I sort of chuckled because I, I could never see me using it for any 
valid reason other than I would love to take it out for a spin just to take it out for, for a spin. Fun. Yeah. Right. I remember but for those yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go for ahead. those who, who definitely have the, the physical uh limitations, it would be incredibly helpful for those. Yeah. Um especially at you know at the parks or the city tours or those sorts of things. I remember a, a decade ago or more now when uh, Dean Cameron introduced the Segway, oh there was all this talk it's gonna change everything. It's gonna change cities. It's gonna and, uh, you know, I mean, it's an interesting, you know, tool, but it's not that big of a difference. You know, it hasn't really changed that much. So uh, we'll see how that goes. It, it certainly I think it it just certainly looks fun. And a lot of tech journalists who went to CES had fun riding, riding around on them at the at the show. Well, and it and it is super impressive because I, I watched the video of them demoing it. Yeah. And the way that it can balance on just two wheels and be a full you, you're sitting in this like pod that's really impressive yes they have really figured that part of the balance part out really well and the guy on the on the who was demoing it off uh, he kept saying that he felt secure in it too he didn't feel like he was gonna fall over in it oh yeah so just yeah impressive technology Maybe these are precursors to the the Mars expeditions. They'll get a whole bunch of these and be able to go all across the Mars uh, <laughs> uh, continents, you know, uh, that way. <laughs> Just there a little air, air protection around them. <laughs> yeah, really, really. Uh, another product from C that I saw at CES that uh, kind of strikes close to home for me was the Weber dem demoed their uh, smoke fire pellet grills and their Weber Connect smart grilling hub. And so... The the big deal with these, so there have been pellet grills for a while now, which they, they burn uh, hardwood compressed pellets instead of charcoal or propane gas, and uh, it, it, which is somewhat more efficient because you more control. But what makes them cool is that they have this Wi-Fi enabled smart hub that has temperature probes that measure the temperature of the air inside the grill and of the meat that you're grilling and up to several cuts of meat. And... What's cool is it connects with an app on your phone that you can then control the temperature in the grill and it will walk you through, even walk you through recipes like, okay, now bump up the temperature now, now take the meat off, let it rest. Okay, it's rested long enough, that sort of thing. To make a lot of these like grilling things really easy, uh, you know, when you're, if you're making burgers, you don't really need this, you know, that's not the sort of thing. But if you make, if you, if you like to smoke meat, you know, do low, low and slow, long cooking. This is the sort of thing that could really be useful. Um, although I got to say, half the fun is sitting outside next to the grill <laughs> with, with a beer. With a beer, <laughs> yeah. Wait, yep. w wait for the next uh, you know time you got to turn it. But uh, it, it's it's I'm I'm kind of tempted by it. It's expensive, but it's kind of tempting. Well, could this be a precursor to some kitchens, large kitchens that have lots of ovens that they could have electronically controlled and feedback? So, so people could uh, do this as in a business, not a grilling necessarily, mm. but ovens that would give you feedback upon with timing and, and all of this type of thing where you would have a, a control station to take care of that. That's kind of what I see this being kind of a, a little put your foot in the water, you know, for that type of thing. Well, in fact, the company that, did, that, that worked with Weber on this, that did the, the app that controlled this and, and some of the smarts, is called June, and they make the June Smart Oven, which does a lot of this. So it's oh okay, I'm it, not familiar with that. So yeah, it's so it's an expensive. It looks like an expensive uh, toaster oven. It's it's larger than a toaster oven, maybe the size of a large uh, microwave oven, but it's an oven, and uh, it has a, an app that you use on your phone, and you can control it remotely with the and you get the probes, and it will it has these smart algorithms that figure out you tell it what you're cooking, and it. And it controls the temperature in the oven um, to I, to cook it in an ideal manner, and then and even to the point of okay, now turn the broiler elements on for a little while, and I turn the baking oven. You know, it does the whole thing for you, and you can monitor it remotely from another room or you know somewhere else on the internet, even you know just away from home if you're brave enough to do that. So I could <laughs> I could see this sort of smarts moving through the kitchen to other appliances. Um, right, especially as it gets less expensive, you just need a basting element in there, you know, just, <laughs> so it can go in and squirt your butter or your your, your <laughs> right. wine or whatever on top. <laughs> right, yeah, the robot kitchen. Well, right. What I like about it too is that it's um 
it, it's a uh, it's something that you can apply to any grill that you already have. Right. Oh, this I didn't is, know that. This is mm. not a you have to buy a whole new grill set. You can. So you can. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can you, with you it can, built in. But but it you also. Will. <laughs> <laughs> um. But but it, you know, uh, and 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 I think that that would appeal to a lot of people. I think of uh, my dad, and and he has a he has a probe that's just connected to another device. It's not an app. It's not a you know. Yep. It's not smart. But it's it's he can see the temperature of the the prime rib that he's got in the oven or if he's got it on the grill um you know rotisserie a chicken or whatever Mm -hmm. he's doing um it sort of take that idea and then make it smart Um, yeah that that's what's interesting about it is there have been these probe thermometers around for a while these wi-fi ones but what makes this one a little different is it's got four probes so you can you have up to four different cuts of meat or if it's a big piece of meat meat probes in different places one can be measuring the temperature inside the grill and one of the meat itself and then it connects with the the app on your phone which walks you step by step you know that's whole thing so it's you're right it's it's it, that's what's one of the things that's great about this is you can you don't have to buy a thousand dollar grill you could buy a hundred and thirty dollar you know little hub accessory uh, yeah. yeah it's really kind of an interesting interesting idea again i'm not sure like I like the idea of having a probe that I can leave in it and I can monitor from, you know, the kitchen, you know, in the house or on the other side yep. of the yard or something uh, without having to stand next to it. Especially when I'm when you especially when you're smoking food, it's opposed to just grilling it, smoking, it, you don't need to stand over it. So uh, I kind of. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's probably that hundred and thirty dollar bit that's going to be mo- the most popular part of that. Uh, then the, another thing that was really big at uh, CES this year. Uh, are these full fo- are foldable screen phones and laptops? So it's it's a instead of having like for like for example a laptop where you open it up and half of it is the keyboard and half of it is a screen. They you open it up and it's all screen. Now these we first saw these last year, but famously they were a disaster. We talked about <laughs> those in an episode uh, last year. Uh, Samsung's the Samsung Fold and some of the others were really uh, they were they were before their time. Uh, they were not ready for prime time, uh, but it seems they're kind of getting there now. So, what do you think of these foldable technology? Uh, is this something you think that we need or want? I think at the moment it's again kind of that it's cool, but it's not really practical, right? Yet, um, uh, some of the some of the videos that I was I was watching on these things, it looked like a really cool way to do like. Um, I take the, take a Kindle and 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 take that concept and and read a book on it because you could fold it and it looks like a book. Um, I'm not, I don't, I I guess off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of any practical use for it other than that it's cool. I mean, it, I could yeah. see it being used for somebody who's making a presentation and they want to show something that's very interactive, something is very fluid, very dynamic. And that type of a screen might really be like, it's not three-dimensional, but it gives a nice wraparound view of something for a presentation. You know, for myself, I I, I could think about that glass breaking and not <laughs> wanting to replace it. <laughs> well, you know, I think about like my iPad. It's I have I have a 10-inch or, you know, the 10.5-inch, and, and they even make the 12.9-inch. The those are... That could be a pretty big slab of glass, but if I could fold it and carry it around, so I still get the same, you know, 12.9, but I fold it and now it's, you know, six and a half inches, which is not much bigger than my phone, <laughs> you know, it's, it makes it pretty small. So I can see that. Uh, but I think really the the promise is in some of the science fiction we've seen uh, that shows like these pocket devices where the screen, you know, folds out or... I'm thinking of like on the expanse where where they have these little pieces of glass uh you know the the TV show on Amazon Prime the pieces of glass that project a, a display around the glass so it's much larger than you know in your and it's in your hand or uh years ago do you remember Gene Roddenberry's oh uh, the earth something earth final conflict there was a show that was out years ago uh, w- the one thing i remember from it was they had these devices it looked it was they held it one hand and you pulled it, sort of unrolled it like a sheet of paper, and it became this wide thing. And it was like, and it became a screen. Uh, so it was like, uh, like the size of it was a, like a scroll. 
Yeah, kind of like, like a, a scroll sc- unfolding. It, yeah. Yes, it unfolded like a scroll, and so you had this little thing that si- slipped in your pocket. But when you wanted to use it, you pull it open, and you get this big wide screen. I think that's really where people want to go: is they want to have a ton of screen real estate without having a giant slab of glass in your pocket all the time. Right. Which is, I think, right. the 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 trade off we have. Um, but, or, or do you think uh, it might be a point towards future tech in terms of like having computers uh, built into like the countertop or, you know, some sort of surface that you wouldn't be carrying it around, but the surface itself might bend for some reason or, you know. Yeah. I mean, to put it away, it bends and folds underneath <laughs> or something like that or. Or even, you know, that, the you know, if we get rid of, if we eventually get rid of physical keyboards and it's you know it's the type on the screen now you the three of us are probably old enough even you father andrew where the idea of getting rid of a physical keyboard is like oh like i I don't know if i ever want to if i want to just type on a screen the rest of my life but you look at kids who are you know 15 years and younger even this is what they're used to now they they type on screen and and the actually the idea of using a physical keyboard is kind of weird for, for a lot of these kids so uh, the I you know having the a a a screen that you can like where your keyboard is, but where you can also write on it and you know do all kinds of things at the same time. It's multi-purpose, and I don't know. I think I think there's a future in that that they're seeing here. Um, I, I'm curious to see where this goes, but the technology is still really in its infancy. I mean, it's still not quite there yet. Right. It, it's pretty well, amazing. Again, it's a predictor, not not the uh, finished product. So. Right, right, right. I think it's got to bake for a few more years before we're ready to to, uh, to bring this out in public. Um, and then uh, one other uh, thing that I wanted to mention was this um, the smart delivery box. Uh, and if if anyone has listened to uh, this week's uh, raising the bets that I do with my wife Melanie, uh, it's it's titled "Put the Parcel in the Box." <laughs> so we got a one of these delivery boxes that you put outside your front door for the. UPS or Amazon guy or the the mailman to put the packages in. So they're not just sitting out there for the porch pirates to see and come and take. And I cannot get them to put the packages in the box. They put them next to the box. They put them on the box. It says deliveries on it. Anyway, it's not a smart box, uh, but it could be. And one of the ways it works is uh, Yale is is selling. In fact, the, 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 the box that they demoed this on, is the exact same box that I got. Um, but they're selling or they're going to sell a lock for the box that interfaces somehow with the delivery companies. It gives, they have to form partnerships with UPS and FedEx and mail, you know, the U, U, UP, uh, U.S. Postal Service and, and those guys. But once they do, it will give them an ability to uh, electronically open the, the lock, put the packages in, and then close it and relock it. So as it is now, they if they put the packages in the delivery box, it's still as as vulnerable as before. It's just nobody knows if there's anything in it. They have to come and look in it to see if there's anything in there. But Except uh, what I saw was that the box, when you got it, you opened it up. I mean, it was lo- unlocked. When When somebody came and put something in it and shut it, it locked at that point. So you right. got one delivery in there. Right, Not, there is, there is so a. It would lock. It would yeah. be more secure that way, in, in yes. that sense. Yes, and that's true. Yeah, I saw some things talk. People talking about how would you manage this, and somebody said you could use the last six digits of the tracking number, and you would program it to only open with that tracking number, and you know, or you might have a, a queue of them at whatever. Right. But that sounded like a pretty good way to get around giving the combo out to everybody. That's true. If the if the if the you know UPS guy has just to look at the tracking number on the package and tap it in, or one of the packages and tap it in, that would be the the way to do it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, if and if there were an automated way of getting that sort of stuff into the system, um, yeah. I, in fact, is I think there's a couple of different products that they demoed, and and both of those were among them. Um, and then they they also have a another. They, they, Yale is owned by uh, the August. Uh, smart lock company now so in and i think they're i think i think it is and i think they're now both owned by amazon if if i if i get the whole chain correctly there that they everyone keeps buying everyone but uh yeah i, I they also uh, demoed a a lock that you can a, a small lock that you can use to put on things like cabinets and other stuff 
like they're thinking like for Airbnb uh, owners, mm-hmm. and they could right. they could choose to unlock things for the people staying at the at the Airbnb or keep it locked or whatnot, that sort of thing. So there's a couple different things, but the whole area of these locks and smart locks is really growing. Uh, I just hope that, uh, well, a I hope I can get convince the delivery guys to start using the box. <laughs> Uh, I, right. I've, I've I've ordered a sign now that goes that I'm going to put on the door that says "Put the parcels in the box." <laughs> it literally says that. Uh, you could put some cookies inside. <laughs> yes, there's a treat for you if you use the box. That's a good idea. Right. Um, but uh, but also the, this idea of the of the latch, uh, porch piracy is a is a problem for a lot of people, and this would be a way to to help deal with that. So I kind of like that idea. Um, anything else that you want to, I mean, there's so much, famously CS is full of all kinds of stuff. Anything else you guys want to mention? I saw one that I was interested in, uh, and wondered what the research showed on, on dyslexia. There was a light that came out that was supposed to be helping one eye stay dominant to help the, the person with dyslexia. And I kept thinking, is this a mm. gimmick or do they really research this? Ooh, interesting. So that, um, uh, it, it's it called claims- Lexalife Lexalite. Huh. And it said in a testing with more than 300 people, 90% of the dyslexic participants reported improved reading abilities. Interesting. Yeah, that should be. I, I, I mean, I've got, you know, I've got people in my yes, family <laughs> who, could, who, who uh, potentially have the dyslexia or some sort of dyslexic condition. Uh, I'd love to t- test that out. That would be interesting if that if that's a the problem with a lot of this stuff is sometimes the product is based on research that's not quite proven out yet that's what i was asking you know i sure would like to see what research is really behind this as opposed to taking 30 people off the street and projecting on it or something right uh, you know supposedly it looks like it was a study that had been done specifically for this but you know who knows i'll send the link yeah well it's in yeah i saw i saw one thing where it said research two years ago suggests dyslexia occurs when so sort of suggests is the key mm. word there. Uh, it's not definitive. Um, right. How about okay, you, Father? Gotcha. You, do you have uh, anything that you thought was pretty interesting? Uh, kind of out there, but um, I feel like we need to at least mention the Mercedes-Benz uh, oh, yes. car. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a, it's an electric, it, so it's a concept car that the Mercedes-Benz brought to CES. So it right. is not at all in production. It's not at all going to appear on the streets in the next few years, but it is based on design from Avatar. And so right. it's, it's called the Mercedes-Benz Advanced Vision Transportation, AVTR. <laughs> and so nice. it's an electric car that can drive forward and it can drive sideways. Um, it has no steering wheel. It's just got this crazy looking futuristic console. Um, it can supposedly, it'll react to your, like if you sit in the car, the way that you can control it and tell that it's you, is it monitor, it's got like biometrics and it will monitor your, like your heartbeat or your, um, uh, I don't know if it, if it does, you know, uh, uh, fingerprints or something, but or voice prints. <laughs> yeah, the I mean, and and the pictures of this vehicle is it it just looks alien and futuristic and sleek, and it's got these like scales on the back of of the ve- of the vehicle that will move, and supposedly those could be used to communicate with other cars or <laughs> or something like because we haven't invented radio just... yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was yeah. just I think one of the one of the. Um, out there sort of concept things yeah. that appeared that was worth noting. I wonder is, uh, yeah, if they, ha- if that was just clearly just like really supposed to be a design idea. Yeah. Apparently James Cameron actually helped design it. The, the director for avatar. So that will be interesting. I'm, wow. I wonder if we'll see one of these in the mo in his uh, sequel movie that's coming out someday. Eventually uh, that might be part of the deal. Uh, yeah, that uh, the the concept cars is really are really interesting. Again, you never they'll never appear on the street in anything close to the form that you see them on the show. They're they're wild. These are supposed to be wild and crazy, draw attention and that sort of thing. But uh, the it's the ideas that they contain that will that sometimes bits of them can show up. It looks like their goal is to create what they're calling a zero impact car, and I'm assuming that means to like like a completely green car, so electric right. and and doesn't impact uh, negatively on the environment. So that that might be like their goal and this is just 
something to showcase the technology that they're trying to use to get to that goal. Right. It's it. It's uh, what uh, I see here. It's built of recyclable, eco-friendly materials right down to the battery that can be composted, which is wow, kind of amazing. Okay. Uh, Sony also had a concept car, which is Sony is doesn't build cars. So they don't they don't sell cars. They apparently built one, but um, I guess it was a test bed for technologies that they're making for car makers, which is probably similar to something that Apple's been hinted at doing with their Project Titan for several years. So kind of interesting. That that's a good that's a good one. Um, also I got I got to mention Bali, Samsung's Bali. Uh, for all the Star Wars fans out there, this is aimed right at you. Uh, and me, it looks it's a little BB-8 for your home. It it has no practical purpose that I've been able to discern, but it has like little bits of smarts in it where it will follow you around, and it has a bit of personality to it. It communicates through beeps and and lights and that sort of thing. So, um, it, it's all there's been a lot of these little personal home robots in the last few years, uh, but almost all of them have sort of failed and gone off the market, and your and the and the little robots have died because the servers they relied on have been turned off. Uh, but Samsung is behind it. That's a big company. Maybe maybe it will less likely to go away, although Google has been known to turn things off too, so who it, knows. But it, it's, it just looks like a ball. It's, it, it's, yeah, but it's supposed to be able to interact with other smart things in your home, and I don't know what they really mean by that. As it, as it walks through, it'll it'll send something to say, turn on these lights or turn yeah. down that that volume or, or I'm not sure what they're looking at but it, it's it would be just a fun thing. I'd like that more than the, the some of the other things that you said you'd like to play with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, maybe I, maybe it tells the rumor that there's a mess on the floor. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I have to say that I I have uh the the Sphero uh, yep. app controlled BB8. Yes. Which, oh, really? Yeah, That's which fun is a lot of fun to play with and and you can like send it off and it'll like scout around the room and you can make it make all sorts of noises and um the r2d2 one will like actually the sound comes from the droid itself and it'll do all sorts of fun stuff that nice. appeals to me way more than a yes. than a ball that I, I, <laughs> I, I, I want <laughs> i want r2d2 and and bb8 not samsung ball right uh, what is it han solo kept calling uh bb8 hey ball <laughs> <laughs> in, in Force Awakens, <laughs> so yes. Um, all right, and in, uh, in, in the usual, there were lots of um, home smart home stuff, lots of accessibility or you know fitness or personal health monitoring stuff. Um, the, the, this those things are still big uh, at CES, and so uh, it's kind of in interesting to think about how there's lots of stuff for that. The big one of the big trends is stuff that that quantifies your life that measures you your weight your heart rate your and i wonder can we go too far with that is there a danger in over quantifying our physical selves uh, can we become too i had, in, in I had thought about that before too is that sometimes the awareness of it may make some people anxious because now they're constantly getting a feedback about what this rate is or that rate is, and it, it may, in some people, based on their personality, be the wrong thing for them. Whereas other yeah. people might say, "Okay, this is an indicator. I, I'll go check it out." Yeah, I, I think you just you just got to be careful and prudent with it. Right. Some people, yeah, would would take it as, um, "I'm not I'm not fit enough. I'm not you know whatever," and 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 would take it to the extreme and be actually harmful to their own health and well being. Yeah. Don't obsess over how bad your sleep is. I never realized right. how bad my sleeping was. Now I'm sleepless about it. Like, you know, <laughs> right. It's a feedback loop. You know, you get in. All right. So that's uh, CES 2020. And folks, if you uh, saw anything in it's you know, from that came out of CES that you thought was interesting, you let us know and we'll uh, we'll bring it up in a future episode and talk about it because uh, there's so much there that there's no way to cover it all. in even in hours and hours of coverage, as you probably saw through all of the tech uh, journalism of the past couple of weeks. Uh, all right, so let's move on to our next story, which is uh, this is an interesting one and an important one. Um, it's it starts with a column from uh, ZDNet, and it's by uh, their they have a, a a security journalist called her name is Charlie Osborne, and it talks about how she worked with a company called CoFence that um, 
helps people understand um, spear phishing attacks or helps protect them from spear phishing attacks. Now, what that means is a spear phishing is, is a very specific term. So um, phishing, we might have heard of, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. That's those emails you get there. It says, oh, your Netflix account has been hacked. You know, click here to log in and check or whatever, one of those things. And they're pretty broad based. They're sent, they send those out to millions of people. And it's usually fairly easy for at least a somewhat sophisticated user to kind of say, that doesn't look right, or I, I'm not clicking on that. I'm not falling for that one. Um, it, so that's that's just general phishing. But spear phishing is different. It's when a hacker or somebody goes after you specifically, and they craft their attack based on publicly available information about you, and or even semi-public information about you. and what this column by Charlie Osborne tells us, and it's called Hook, Line, and Sinker, How I Fell Victim to Phishing Attacks Again and Again. She talks about how they they mined her social media, her friends and family's social media to find out very specific information about her that some of them she was able to to to, to kind of catch, but some of it actually got through to her and and she fell for. Now, of course, they, it was just a demo of their of of how it can be done, and they didn't actually steal any of her information, as far as she knows. Uh, but you know, she it was it, the only thing harmed was her her ego. I think you know she she admits. Uh, and now the 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 one, on the one hand, we might say, oh, you know, I'm nobody. You know, why I, I don't I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not famous. You know, celebrity. Why would anyone go to all the trouble to figure out for me? But if you're any kind of public figure, like a priest or religious or someone who has access to sensitive information, if you work in accounting, maybe you're a pastoral associate who has, who has uh, access to certain files in your parish or certain information, those sorts of things can make you a target of that sort of attack. Uh, so what do you all think of this? Uh, do, do, do we need to be concerned? Have you seen anything like this before? Father, what, what about you? I think we absolutely have to be concerned. Um, I I loved how at the end of that that article uh, they they listed just a number of ways to protect yourself, and and the very first one was be skeptical of each and every message, um, right. especially if you're busy or rushed. And and I just that that's true of of most every email that comes in. If you're if you get an email that you know you just you think something might be off, it it very likely could be. Um, and, and so I, I've actually, I didn't fall victim to this sort of an attack, but I had an experience with this sort of an attack. Um, and it was really interesting because, um, this would have been a, a number of months ago, but I got, I got an email from my Bishop and, um, it basically said, uh, I, I need, I need you, you know, would you email me back? And immediately I thought, well, he's never contacted me in this way before. And then I looked at the email address itself, and it was Reverend Stephen Bigler at gmail dot com, which yeah. again flew up some red flags for me because he has a diocesan email, right? Not a Gmail, and it was a a um his title from as a priest, not his title as a bishop. But in my mind, I thought, well, maybe maybe this is just his email for before he was ordained a bishop, and something is going on, and so I emailed back. And, um, you know, said, you know, what's going on? How can I help? And um, I get an email back saying, you know, something to the effect of he has these people in need and he needs me to go get some gift cards and <laughs> and bring them to him. And and so then I, I was like, OK, this is obviously fake. So then I just emailed him back and I and I um, said, you know, can you just give me a call? Like, uh, you know, he's got my cell phone number. He's got all the other ways to communicate. And I got an email back saying, I'm in a meeting. I can't use my phone right now. And I was just <laughs> like, huh, but he can send emails, but he can't call. And so I was right. like, okay. I emailed back and I said, I know this is a scam. Don't ever email me again and just sent it off. Yeah. But since then, I've noticed that we, and I, and I think, I think all the priests in the diocese are all those who are connected to the chancery have gotten these similar emails even since and i've noticed that the email address has changed from reverend to the most reverend or they they've they've gotten a little bit smarter in how they're forming it and and so again for for me it was easy to pick up right away that it was that it was a scam 
right. but for someone who is not quite as clued into those sorts of clues, you could easily fall in, fall victim of this. Or even my my pastor has had email sent from him, quote unquote, to parishioners who have fallen for this and and you know sent sent money off to someone because they thought it was our pastor and right. And and we've actually had to send out bulletin announcements and, uh, you know, announcements uh, at mass saying, we're not going to ask you for money through email. Just, you know, know right. that. So it's it's definitely possible. And especially in the church circles. I mean, if you're if you receive an email from your priest or your bishop saying that you, they need help, you're way more likely to, to respond and give Christians something are, because you think yeah. it's legit. Christians are a prime target. Uh, active Christians who are, you know, we're known for our charity. We would mm-hmm. be a prime target for people taking advantage of our desire to help and and to 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 do loving acts for others. So yes, that is very true. And and you make a good point too that when it's not just whether I'm savvy about the, about stuff that I get, but I can become a victim. And that's one of the things she points out in this article. I can become a victim if if one of my friends or family falls prey to the, something like this because they can give out information about me that makes me more vulnerable. They could they could give out information that I think only oh only my mom knows that. So this must be my mom. You know, and and that makes me vulnerable. So we've got to help educate our family and friends to not fall fall prey to these things, not just be wary ourselves. Um one of the things that I think is would be a valuable tool is to is to, to look at email as not the email especially as not a secure form of communication. Be suspicious of any email that to rely on something that's more secure, like send me a text to my 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 cell phone that only you know I only give out to to, to people that I I know in person or something like that. Um, so that's or as you say, give me a call or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Don't don't trust Facebook messenger messages. Don't trust uh, emails. Don't trust those sorts of things. A call is the best thing because they you hopefully you'll recognize the voice. Or even Unless just, they say they have a cold yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> or they're crying or whatever, yeah. which I've had people uh, skim that way. Oh, interesting. Um, but also just, yeah, find some way to independently verify what's going on. And and especially like if you receive an email, quote unquote, from Amazon.com wanting you to click this link to, to yes. check your package delivery status or something, rather than clicking the link, never click the link, but go to the actual website and type it into your browser, Amazon.com, and get to your your tracking that way. And just ignore the email because if anything, if anything is truly wrong, you'll see it when you log into your account, and you don't need to actually click through the email. Right, and never click on attachments, no matter what they appear to be, even if it yep. appears to be just a simple image or simple something. It you it's easy enough to disguise a an executable or app or virus or trojan as something else, and it so many people have been caught badly, you know, caught as in had themselves exposed by clicking on attachments. Because what that can do is, especially if you do it on a work computer, it can open up your entire network to being to being uh, run through by hackers. That's what, you know, a lot of these, if you've seen in the news, these ransomware attacks where like entire towns have had their computer networks locked down and all their data trashed and held ransom for millions of dollars. But by all that's mainly because someone clicked, probably either clicked on a link or clicked on an attachment that they shouldn't have. On their, on a work device, and that that's the thing. So don't click on links. To, if and if you know if you you have to go to your bank account, your bank account is being emptied. So click click on this link to go to your bank account. No no no. Close the email. Open up your browser. Type in the bank the bank's domain. Mm-hmm. You know that sort of thing. And that's a real problem with attachments because you know there are legitimate reasons that people send each other attachments. That right. I usually tell people if you. Is it the normal course of business is you're exchanging attachments with this person? Okay. But if they, you get an attachment from someone else or you don't, uh, haven't heard from them for a while, you know, never trust them. Right. But, but there are legitimate work uses for attachments. And That's unfortunately, right. there's not much way we can say to everybody, never ever use an attachment because 
we all but, have to sometimes. Right. But you can always uh, verify the email address. Sometimes though, those are spoofs, though. True, true. And the other thing is, is, you know, text them and say, hey, did you just send me this? Right. Mm -hmm. If you have any suspicion, verify through a different communications medium. Yeah, that... don't don't email back to that same person. Right. It, no. It's terrible that we have to do this. And, and there are, there are um, antivirus and malware protection uh, software out there that will scan your attachments for you and that sort of thing. And even Google does a pretty good job of scanning attachments and, and, and uh, getting rid of them for you. If you use Gmail, uh, they, they, they get a lot of, they, they find a lot of Trojan horse and malware and virus attachments and, and screen those out before you even see them. So that's a, that's pretty good, a uh, little bit of help there, but uh, it's just, we have to be very cautious and we have to help others to learn to be very cautious because the you know it used to be easy to spot the you know the the Nigerian prince who wants to give you a million dollars i mean that's it's hard to fall for that people did but it's hard to fall for that but they're getting more sophisticated they're fixing their grammar and spelling and they're using accurate image you know graphics and that sort of stuff it, it it's not going to take much to make these emails indistinguishable from the real thing and so we have to make ourselves more sophisticated in return uh, so. And especially with that one, the the journalist, the very fact she was aware she was in a test, right? And she still let you know, Got still hooked. made mistakes. Yep. And and that's even being on a heightened awareness. So yes, uh, what was it? The one where they uh, figured out somehow that she liked to do photography as a hobby yes. and sometimes got paid to do it, and she had friends who were involved in motorcycles and took some photos of them at one point and. So they were hiring her to do a wedding, their wedding, and she got <laughs> she got sucked in sucked that in. way. Yeah, that was uh, it. It was sophisticated. If they want to get you, they you know they they can get in there. So uh, be cautious. We'll put a link to her article, and you can find the the ten uh, takeaways that she had at the better the ten ways to or nine ways to protect yourself from uh, from spear phishing attacks. Um, all right, so uh, let's t talk about a couple headlines this week, some shorter stories. Um, or, or let's start with the, the drone one. There's this whole drone thing in Colorado, uh, which is up up your way, Father, uh, <laughs> in your it, direction. It, it involves my city, even. <laughs> so, oh, really? Sort yeah. of. The, the F.E. Warren uh, Air Force Base, which is, mm -hmm. which is just right here in Cheyenne. Okay, okay. Uh, so there's a uh, – the New York Times story, I think, is really where – we, we could begin with this, um, but it's been reports for, for some time now, for a couple of months, I think, where people have been saying that there are these drones, groups of large drones flying in formation over large areas of the, of Colorado and Nebraska in precise formation, they said. And, you know, that they're, they fly over the house and they linger and they're, and, the FAA says we don't know anything about it. The Air Force says we're not, we're not doing anything. You know, all these government agencies are are they don't know. Uh, it's even got to the point where they formed um, task government task forces to track it down, and they're flying planes with IR, you know, uh, infrared, uh, you know, cameras and all that sort of stuff. That and they haven't been able to find anything. Uh, and now we're wondering are they UFOs or whatever. And then we have. Uh, Another story, I think, Pat, did you, was this from you today? Right. Uh, so right. An, another story, for, this one in uh, Motherboard uh, from uh, from Vice, vice.com, that says maybe there's no mystery at all, uh, which is interesting. So what do you all think of this? Like, they think that maybe this is drone hysteria, that drones are such in the news now. And whenever we have new technology that really gets out there a lot and has people nervous about their capability that creates lots of news stories about it. Like, like the Craigslist, you know, horror stories that were in the media about t a decade ago, you know, when we all, were always hearing about bad Craigslist things. Uh, so what do you think of this? Is something to think of, worry about? Uh, do you think there's really drones up there? What do you think? But it's almost like some of the, the people that they've got a point of view, they want to get it out there. They don't know how to get other people convinced so they come up with a story that says, oh, there's all of these horrible things going on so that they can get what is whatever legislation passed or whatever right. uh, protest groups out there. 
I kind of think there may be some, I don't want to say hysteria, because that means something slightly different, but a little bit of somebody behind feeding a story that may not be true. Because, as you say, the planes, they haven't found anything with infrared or anything like that. They haven't found any actual evidence of it. Hmm. What do you think, Father? Yeah, I I, I was uh, watching one of the videos, and even even the the video footage that they sort of have, or those uh, there was a couple um, just uh, people who were trying to follow it and and had some video. There, yeah, there, there's not much evidence in general for it. I I guess I I I hate to to doubt news stories and and you know assume that it's all just a hoax or a conspiracy and. Um, any of that sort of thing. And I mean, even the, the, the government isn't getting involved. And in, um, and that's how it related to Cheyenne was that um, the F.E. Warren Air Force Base does do drone operations. Right. But they they responded and said that that was not them. In fact, and none do, of the government agencies, yeah. you know, have, they've all said that they they are not involved. Right. Um, so. I mean, it it, it could be just. I mean, they they were suggesting a private company that's using it to either do some sort of mapping or search and rescue tactics or something because they the drones were were in formation and were searching or doing a grid in search, a grid like yeah. pattern. Yeah, but don't you think that some one of these companies might come forward and say, "Well, you know, we're doing some investigation using drones." It's well, just forget the story. Well, you know? the fact is, is, if they were doing that, they have you have they have to clear that with the FAA these days. I mean, you can't. Uh, you can't right. do th that sort of stuff without getting, and so if they're doing it without FEA clearance, that they would get in big trouble. So they they'd have to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> oh yeah, and forgiveness <laughs> usually comes in the in a, in a form of a big cash uh, fine right. from from the FAA or being shut down. So I could see that possibility, but yeah, it's very interesting. And maybe I'll have to 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 give this one over to Jimmy Aiken for uh, our Jimmy Aiken's <laughs> Mysterious World. And, and get well, it reminds take. me of the Phoenix Lights. Well, that's the thing I was thinking. Maybe the Phoenix Lights. We talked about that. And if you want to check that out, in fact, I'll have to put a link in the show notes about the infamous uh, Phoenix Lights incident, which sort of predates drones. But uh, Jimmy goes through that. Uh, th there was this famous incident of these lights flying in formation over the city of Phoenix, seen by uh, tens of thousands of people. Uh, and... Were they planes? Were they balloons? Were they flares? Were they? And so Jimmy goes through everything systematically and sort of. I don't think we come to a a conclusion on that one, uh, but you could you could uh, listen to it for yourself and see what you think. But that's uh, Jimmy Aiken's mysterious world. We we talk about a lot of fun stuff like that. Those are my favorite ones: is the uh, the unknown flying objects uh, that was. Yes. Uh, so well, not to use the term UFO. <laughs> uh, well, you know that, that's loaded language nowadays. Uh, yeah, I'm wearing my T-shirt for that, by the way. I don't know if you notice. Uh, oh, oh yeah. I have my X Files T-shirt uh, that has the poster "I Want to Believe" with the uh, UFO on it. So uh, that's that's me. That, I, I'm that guy. I, I did think one of the takeaways though was was in the article, Pat, that you you sent out was that like we can take this sort of thing and just get so caught up in what in the unknown and just right. allow that to dictate how we live. And so we can't we can't just let that fear of the unknown prevent us from living. Um, and so I, I appreciate that, that like at the end of the day, we may never, ever have us have an answer to what these are. But, you know, mm -hmm. does it does it really matter? Maybe, right. maybe not. But you can't let you can't let that obsession or that fear that, you know, there might be drones tracking your every movement prevent you from going out and living your life. In fact, that's good advice in general. I see this a lot in social media today where people are living in fear of things that, practically speaking, would they, there's no need to be afraid of because it won't affect you, you know, or, or it's unlikely to affect you. It's unlikely, you know, the, we were just talking about, you know, the, the spearfishing attacks uh, where, you know, we have to be careful. But do we need to worry about, say, someone hacking into our cameras and our computers and watching us or something like that? Maybe, maybe not, but, but, you know, take reasonable precau precaution and then be calm about it. Well, and I see so much of this on, on, on Facebook where people will say, you know, if you've got this thing on your windshield, it means that somebody's trying to do right. uh, trafficking or you see a bottle over on the corner. Well, that's got to have an acid in it. And it just blows up all over social media with fear. And that's that's what I really hate. Right. I and mean, I really do. We can't I fear that. Fear. Yes, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> yes. All right. I think that's uh, that's good. I think we should move on to our uh, picks of the week here. That was a good uh, good set of discussions there. 
Uh, but um, one of my favorites, and I know for a lot of our listeners, uh, their their favorite part of the show is our picks of the week. So why don't we uh, go to that? And Father Andrew, what's your pick of the week? So my pick of the week, um, I tried to uh, just think through like apps or technology that I use very consistently and all the time. And I was sort of surprised when I stumbled across this one because I hadn't used it as a pick of the week before because I use this all the time. It's audible. Yes. Uh, I, I love, love, love audiobooks and, um, do quite a bit of driving, um, especially being a priest in Wyoming for, <laughs> for various either events or, right. um, just in general. And, and I love to have either podcasts to listen to. So, um, or audiobooks often. Uh, and, and so audible.com, you can go and you can purchase audiobooks and you can download them to your phone. It works. The, the app works on iPhone, Android, um, and the Windows platform. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just a, it's a great way to dive into a book when you're, you know, either on the road all the time or, or you're sitting in the comfort of your lazy boy too. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you uh, a, a little. Uh, I love Audible too, for not just for myself, but for the whole family. Um, if you're a parent who has a child who's a late reader, they're 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 they'll just you know slower than other kids. Not every kid reads as fast. It starts to read well as fast as other kids. They're a late reader, but they might have say siblings who are fast readers. Like they and they're all reading these great books, and they can't participate. Audible is a great way for them to participate and to be able to to read these books. And I call it reading, even though it's they're listening to it to get the experience of these books uh, and be able to participate. So like I have one, one of my children who is uh, a late reader and the other kids have all read these fantastic series of books, like the young wizard series, the mysterious Benedict society, and they all get to talk about it with each other. And this other child got left out, but now they are able to, we had a, a spare thank Thanks to grandma. We had a spare <laughs> old iPhone uh, that we put audible on in, in some books. So yeah, that is great. It is great. Um, the other thing they have there is the uh, the Great Courses series on Audible, yeah. um, and my wife has been listening to those, and she listened to one on language, on like uh, linguistics and language, um, which has the uh, uh, on the on the cover it has the Tower of Babel, which is a lot of fun. Oh, uh, nice yeah. biblical image. Uh, again, just fantastic. So yeah, I heartily, wholeheartedly recommend Audible. Uh, it's really great. I'll throw out one other cool thing about it, especially if you have, uh, you know, a child who's still struggling to read. Um, there is, it's called immersion reading. You can actually mm -hmm. listen to the book and read along with it. Uh, but you have to have the Amazon Kindle book as well as the audio book. Right. And they can, they can work together. That's true. That's great. And they give you a reduced rate on that combination. Yes. You don't have to pay full freight on both. Right. You, you get a, yeah, you get a discount. Yeah, that's actually a great. Um, that may be something we need to move to uh, soon. That would be great. Um, I I loved it. We listened to Swallows and Amazon series uh, on our big cross country trip in 2018, and I love the Swallows and Amazon's uh, series of books. It's it's great for the whole family. Uh, and yeah, it's Allison Larkin is the reader, and she's so fantastic. But uh, uh, you can tell I'm 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 high on uh, Audible, so yeah, <laughs> I'm really big on that. Awesome, awesome pick, Pat. What's your pick? Well, it seems silly, but it is technology. Okay. And for those people who like lattes and cappuccinos and things like that, but you can't really afford to go to the store all that often to get them, and I don't have a cappuccino machine, my family gave me a little frother. It's uh, it's It stands about six inches tall. You put two batteries in. You fill a deep cup. You don't want a shallow cup <laughs> with a little bit of milk, and you can either warm it or not. And you stick that in, and a few seconds later, you've got all this lovely foam, and you can sprinkle your cocoa on top, and it it's it's a simple way to give me pleasure in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you could do it with hot chocolate. Yeah, you know, I will have to say, I sometimes add eggnog to my my uh, morning coffee when it's holiday time. Mm. It does not froth egg well, yeah. uh, eggnog well though. <laughs> it's a little thick for that, I guess. Yeah. That's a great idea. It's and it's you know it's it's, it's very inexpensive. A couple bucks. It's, oh, less than ten dollars. Yeah, I think a, you know six ninety five on uh, Amazon right now. So uh, right. that's great. That's a great little idea. A little a little bit of technology to make your life a little better in the morning uh, when you're make it spruce up your cup of coffee. Uh, so uh, you know it actually would be really handy for like scrambling eggs. Maybe I don't know. Maybe we'll have to I'll have to try that out. Uh, I tried it. I tried it with egg whites. It, it didn't work. Oh, okay. Maybe not enough oomph on that. 
All right. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's what it was. My pick of the week is a web service called Camel Camel Camel. So just like it sounds, Camel 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 dot com. And what it is, it's 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 straightforward, but it's it's a brilliant idea. It you when you you create an account and then you put in product links from Amazon, and you could do this. You could tell it to even to go and look at your Amazon wish list, uh, and 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 populate itself with with what's on there. And then it will give you the historical pricing chart for products. The thing is, something you got to know about Amazon, if you don't know already, is that the prices go up and down all the time. Amazon is constantly changing the prices of products that on their site. Everything is constantly changing prices based on some algorithm of what you know, adjusting to the demand and supply, and trying to get people to buy it, all this sort of stuff. And what Camel 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 does is they watch the prices of the things that you tell it to, and will alert you. When the product reaches a price that you say, this is how much I want it to be. Now, you could say, whatever it hits the historic low for that product. You could say, whenever it drops 10% or 20%, you, you could tell it, do it for uh, all things, whether it's used, new, or th- third-party uh, sellers. You could just say, just do it for stuff that's direct from Amazon. And I've got all kinds of things on there. And I don't always buy the things immediately as soon as I get the uh, the price that I want, because uh, sometimes I'm like, eh. Now's not the time for it, but I just let the the price watches go, and uh, you know I've got gosh, uh, wow, is that really two hundred thirty six total price watches? That includes ro- watches uh, on direct from Amazon, third party, and used. So divide that by three, and it's probably like, but still like seventy different things. I put stuff for like I want a potential birthday or Christmas gifts, um, things that are sort of pie in the sky. Like here's an example, um, I use. Uh, two terabyte external hard drives for my backups, and those don't last forever. So I want to, you know, replace those every once in a while. But they can be expensive. So I set a a price target on that. That's about ten or twenty percent off the usual price. And then uh, whenever it hits that, I'll buy one. So then just keep it on hand, and that way I'm getting a good deal on it. And then because the, those little external hard drives only last for a few years, you don't want to push them beyond two or three years uh, in, because they'll, they'll, they eventually go bad. So uh, it's really nice. It's a great service. Uh, they, and, uh, you know, you get, check it out. So it's camelcamelcamel.com. Uh, and that's it. So have you, either of you ever used used that uh, service? Oh, okay. No, I haven't. All right. No. Now, is that uh, – I know that there's a lot of my customers that I find honey on their machine. Right. And and I've I've heard conflicting things that it's not a scam that, that it really is a valid product and it's not a but I didn't know if that was the same type of thing that Camel 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 was or something totally different. It's different, but it was Amazon yeah. related. I knew. Yeah, Honey is an extension you you install and it watch it it watches your movement through Amazon or and other sites, not just Amazon, and it will puts it puts something on the page for you. Uh, Honey does. And oh, you okay. click it, and it finds a coupon or a deal or a better deal somewhere else, that sort of thing. Um, Camel 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 doesn't do that. You have to specifically put a product into it okay, for it to gotcha. monitor it for you, which I I kind of like a little better. I've been testing yeah. Honey and another one called uh, Wiki Buy, um, which I actually I got a pretty good deal on on something. I saved some money on something using Wiki Buy, and Wiki Buy like it, we, even on um, lots of non Amazon sites, it will try different uh, coupon codes that it knows of and maybe try to get you a deal with a coupon code. I have it hasn't worked for me so far yet, so we'll see <laughs> we'll see if that's useful. But I've been trying some of these out, but I am a little worried about these different services, what kind of information they're gathering on my shopping habits and that sort of thing. So, um but you know, Amazon has all, all that info already, so Yeah, they know me well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh so that's it's it's uh I I Camel Camel Camel's one I can recommend so far. All right. I think that should just about do it. Uh, uh, we'd like to first take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Secrets of Technology, including David F., Michael D., Mark C., Blake L., and John and Greta C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Technology and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of any of the things we had to discuss today? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash technology. 
or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia, or send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. And we'll put links from all of our discussions and our picks of the week on our show notes at sqpn.com. If you can, we would greatly appreciate it if you could write a review of the podcast in Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast directories and to share the podcast with your friends to help us grow our community of listeners and reach more folks. Until next time, Pat Scott, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of technology. Adios. Father Andrew Kinstetter, thank you as well. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. And once again, I'm Dom Bethanelli. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Thank you.